Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, you've heard the children's message. You've heard the, the song we just sang. Uh, we're to, and, you, and you heard Jesus' words in the gospel. Uh, prayer is, is where we're going to talk about some today. Um, prayer is an important part of our life, right? We, we, we set aside a time in worship every week. We, we always have a long list uh, of, of things that we pray about. How, how many of you, I'm just curious by show of hands, uh, maybe in your own prayer time during the week, have your own list of things that you, that you, that you pray for regularly? Okay, so by the way, that's one of the best, resp- best group responses we've ever had. So that just tells me prayer is an important part of what you do. Um, it's, it's important throughout the church. There's a, a, a special, very short 24-hour retreat for, for pastors this week. Uh, I'll be out on one, uh, Thursday afternoon to Friday. Uh, pastors from across the district gathering at Camp Lone Star uh, just to pray. Uh, a prayer retreat, a time for the, for the pastors to uh, have some time in solitude, but also to gather praying for each other, praying for the things that are on our hearts and minds. Uh, we, we see Jesus throughout Scripture. Uh, taking time, walking away, praying. Now, that, if we think about it for a second, it's a little strange. Jesus is God. And yet Jesus in his ministry, his whole time here as he, as he goes about and does all that he does, Jesus even needs to take time to stop and, and to, to be strengthened, to be fed, to converse with the Father And so Jesus himself takes time in prayer. And I use that as that last example to kind of show just the significance, the importance of prayer as a gift that God has given us. And and it's in that that the disciples perhaps saw something too in the words today, the quote from them, Jesus, teach us to pray. That's how the reading started out. And it does seem a little odd. I you would have expected that they would have kind of already known, or maybe they had already seen some stuff. But they, they ask Jesus this, and Jesus teaches them to pray. He says, when you pray, pray this way. Our Father, and, and uh, it continues with those things. And, and um, again, if you notice that it, was a little, it seemed a little strange to you, it's uh, uh, an abbreviated version of something he would have taught them more fully. If you go to Matthew 6 at some point, you'll see a more full version of what we would call the Lord's Prayer. You see the entire thing there. We still do that prayer, and I think that is remarkable. You heard me talk to the kids about it. From that time forward, Jesus introduced that into our culture and our life, and we have been praying that prayer ever since. But, but let me ask you too then, how, how do you pray? Is it, is it quietly? Is it out loud? Pastor Chris and I just discovered something about ourselves this morning. You know, I don't know if you notice, every time we come out here uh, and we bow, I say a little prayer and uh, come to find out that he's saying one silently because I said, do you want to say the prayer out loud today? He says, I'll just do my silent one like I always do. So, so even there, there's two different ways. One prays silent, one plays out loud. Uh, how many of you do it closing your eyes? Pray. Not while you're driving, I hope. How many of you pray while driving? Sometimes depends on where you're at, I suppose, right? Uh, there's all sorts of ways we can think about praying. Uh, does, how many of your minds wander? Just a few. Uh, I did have one encouragement for folks. We, this was actually on a different prayer retreat. When your mind wanders, rather than fighting it, pray for it. Maybe that's the Spirit's guidance to you, right? As you're thinking, you're praying, okay, I should be praying for this. And and the Lord says, well, what about, you know, you got this to worry about today and this to worry about. Stop and pray for those things. Maybe that's God's way of saying you should should just take that time. Anyway, that's a little side there. There's all sorts of things we could talk about. What makes prayer? And we each do things a little bit differently. But I want to talk today, at least uh, for a little bit here, about one thing that I think is essential to all of our prayers, right? If we were to make a list, well, what, what do you have to have to, to pray? Do you have to hold, fold your hands? Do you have to close your eyes? Do you have to bow your head? Does any of that make the prayer a prayer? So we talk about this being prayer. C- 
could, I pray like this. I might get thrown out of church here if I didn't pray with my hands lifted up and looking up, but, but sure, I could pray any of those ways. So those the hows aren't essential except for one thing. And the essential is that we pray, well, what do you, well, we pray in Jesus' name. It is that we approach the Father through Jesus. And we, it is essential to our prayer because it is only because of Jesus that we can pray to him. Follow me here. I want you to start. We're going to look at that first story today that you read, the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. And this will set the stage for us. Sodom and Gomorrah was a place of tremendous sin. Right? And God was going to come down. If you don't know the story, it says God was going to come down. He's going to wipe the two cities out. Their sin is great. And I want to start there to make you to see and make sure we understand. Does God take sin seriously? Yeah. Right? Good. He takes sin very seriously. Now, the sin, as it's understood in this story, is, 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 is of a sexual nature. Many will point out that it uh, talks about homosexuality. But if we continue to read the story, there is other sexual sin happening here. Lot uh, sends his daughters out to offer them up in place of the angels that have come. Uh, it's just a, it's a horrible situation. Later on, Lot's daughters are going to engage in their own sexual sin with others. Uh, it's just, it just shows the complete depravity of the whole situation going on here. And our tendency is to focus on that one sin. And so that's why he destroyed it, and that just shows how, God, how much God hates that particular sexual sin. But we forget God's wrath and anger against all sin. I want you to go, uh, if you have your pew Bible there in front of you, page 955. Or if you have an app, as Pastor Chris mentioned last week, we're going to go to 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9, page 955 in your pew Bible. Okay, New Testament, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9. God's, Paul's writing about sin, okay, this unrighteousness. Do you not know that the unrighteous, the sinful, will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. And here's his list. Neither the sexually immoral, idolaters, adulterers, men who practice homosexuality, thieves, the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Now, if we're looking at the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, you get there's, they are listed specifically here. However, there's a whole other long list of sins. God is serious about sin, and it keeps us from him. And if you think you're doing okay, just look someplace else on the list, and you'll see that you are not okay. There's a great quote attributed to Luther. He talks about, if you think you do not have need of, of, of God's grace and forgiveness, it's just a bit of a paraphrase. He says, check to see if you're alive. If you think you're not sinning, if you think that you don't have a struggle, if you think there's not something that God is upset with you about, check to see if you're alive. The implication here, the understanding is, if you're breathing, you must be sinning. Back to the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. God is going to destroy the city because of sin. And we get this exchange between God and Abraham. And I don't know about you, but this is a very interesting exchange, this conversation. Abraham is near and dear to God, right? He, God has chosen Abraham to uh, be the one whose bloodline will, will bear the Savior. Uh, Abraham is no slouch. And so he goes to God and he says, all right, Lord, I get it. You're going to destroy the city. It's, it's horrible. But if there's 50 good people, 50 righteous, will you spare it? And he gives these reasons why God should not do that because of that. And what does God say? I'll, I'll spare it. I will spare the whole city. He, was, he will not destroy that whole group for 50 people. And this is where Abraham gets, gets kind of brave, right? Because he says, well, what about 45? What about 40? What about 30? Right? Testing God's patience. I can't imagine doing that to God. And finally, they go through this whole exchange until they get it down to how many people? 10. Will you spare this whole city for 10 righteous people? 
God is so upset he's going to destroy the city, but, but he promises Abraham, if I find 10 people, I won't do it. I want you to see today that as we talk about prayer, Abraham is in a special position. Abraham is the go-between for the people and God. God is ready to destroy the city, but, and, and, and they don't know this. Abraham does, and he steps in. He knows God's mind. He knows the plan, and he says, God, but what about those 10 righteous people? He reminds God of his promises. He steps in for the people. He is the intermediary. He's the go-between. This is the idea of prayer that I want you to have when we talk about praying in Jesus' name. It is because of Jesus that we can go to the Father, period. Jesus is the go-between for you and I. We've already acknowledged our sinfulness. And, and, and we've said and we've seen in Scripture that the wages of sin, the result of sin in our life is what? It is death. We each deserve death. There is none of us, no matter how good or righteous we think we are, because of any sin, we are bound for condemnation and death. Sin keeps us from the Father. That's why we can't see him. Scripture goes on about it. No one can see or be near to the Father. He is pure and holy. We would be consumed because of his holiness. We would die because of our sin. God knew this, by the way, and as you understand, as you read those stories, and, and we begin to see, and I want to hopefully draw something else out here for you, in those Old Testament stories, and, and, and God understands his holiness and how he, we can't be next to him, and if you think about it in the buildings, there was the tabernacle and the temple, and there was a, a special place that only the one priest could go to once a year. Anybody else that went to that place, what happened to them? They would die. Okay, so God is separating them, keeping them safe from his presence. And even if that one guy went in, and all that separated the people was a, was a curtain. Seems kind of silly, but it, it is what was there. There was a curtain that separated the people from God at that point. And there were many different levels to this, right? You had an outer courtyard, inner courtyard, and finally you get to the, the very middle. And God separated himself from the people in that way, and only the priests could be that go-between. And it kept them safe. Kept them safe because of the sin. Now, fast forward then to later in the New Testament and a seemingly insignificant event. As Jesus dies on the cross, I want you to think about that scene. There's this huge earthquake and the sky darkens and all this stuff happens and a seemingly insignificant thing happens. The curtain in the temple does what? It rips in half. The protection that was there for the people to keep them safe from this holy God because of their sinfulness, it's meant to be this barrier. The temple curtain rips in two. Why? They don't need the protection anymore. Why don't they need the protection? Jesus, Jesus, what has Jesus done with their sin? He's taken the sin away. And now we have access to the Father through, through Jesus. Yeah, that's a little complicated conversation there, but Scripture's pointing this out to us. We were separate from God because of our sin. Physically separated even, as, as you see in the temple, in that curtain. But as Jesus comes in and as he dies and he takes that sin away, the separation is gone. You have been made holy. You have access to God through Jesus and what he does. Without Jesus, we don't. Jesus has stepped into the Father's presence and he pleads for us, just like Abraham did. Well, Father, will you destroy them for 10 people? Will you destroy them for five people? How many, let's just suppose God was going to come to Giddings and destroy it because of the sin that's here. How many righteous people might he find if, if Abraham was going to pray for Giddings and he says, well, what about the 50? No, if I find 50. Well, what if he finds 40, 30, and finally gets down to 10? Could he find 10 righteous people? Mm, not so much. Again, just based on our own actions. Could he find one based on our own actions? The truth is no. 
But, but we have one greater than Abraham pleading for us. We have somebody greater than that going to the Father. And you have been remade. I want you now to go to page 984. This is Colossians, uh, from today's reading, Colossians verse 13, page 984. Because I want you to understand, again, as we talk about this sin and this separation, the condemnation it brings, that we should be afraid of that. As we look at our lives, it should worry us. But there's a promise that comes in this verse, and you heard this. In you who were, what in your trespasses? Dead. You were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of flesh. God made alive together with him, having forgiven all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Jesus has stepped into this place for you, sinful, broken as you are. And then, as you go back to that story, there were not 10 people that were there in Sodom and Gomorrah. There was not one person, because as the story goes, and, and, and I don't know if you know this, you haven't read the rest of the story, he does destroy the city. So Sodom and Gomorrah utterly destroyed. But you, you have been saved through what Jesus has done. Uh, verse 12, the same thing. You have been buried with him in baptism. This here, this font right here, God has joined you to Jesus. You were buried with him there, and you were raised with him through faith in the workings of God who raised Jesus from the dead. We pray to the Father through Jesus because he has made you holy. Oh, wait, Pastor, you just, I just went on and on about how sinful and broken you are, and yet God declares you holy. Which is it? Are you the sinful, broken person that I described, or are you the holy person? <laughs> Good. Somebody got it. Yes, is the answer. All right, we can look at ourselves. I can look at each of you. You can look at me. And we know that we are utterly broken, we are utterly sinful, without hope, except for God has declared you righteous and holy through Jesus. And both are true. As God sees you, by faith, as you look to him, as you see in your brokenness that you have no hope in yourself, as you look to Jesus, as you remember that you were covered in the waters of baptism, we're going to see that happen today at second service as those two kids are brought to baptism. God clothes them with Jesus' perfection and righteousness. And this side of heaven, it's a struggle. Each and every day, it's a battle. My sinful flesh and its desires versus God's declaration of holiness. My prayer, my prayer today, through Jesus, is that, well, that I would continue to see my sin, repent of it, and trust in God's mercy, but that you would do the same. That you would see the sinfulness and brokenness in your life, that you would cling with the only hope you have, which is in Jesus. And that by that, you would see the new life you have, that Jesus has freed you from that past of sin, that you may live a new life with him, to stop sinning, to trust in him, and to live the life that he has called you to. That's my hope and prayer, and we trust in Jesus' mercy. May he continue to lift you up in your own prayer life, that you would continue to see those things and rest alone in his promises. In Jesus' name, amen. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus from now to life everlasting. Amen.